everyone. Thanks for joining us in this edition of the live event. We have today an esteemed guest and co-founder of XLA Collab, a person whom I have known for years, um, an industry veteran, talking us and leading us through this uh, session on leading the art and science of experience. Thanks, Alan Nance, uh, for joining us in this edition. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. Thank you, uh, Suresh. Okay, so Alan, kind of um, tell us, you have been pioneering about the term called XLA for quite some time now. Um, what was pivotal for you, you know, having a long standing service management career, what prompted you to get to the space of experiences? Give us a little bit of background on the journey that you took along with Bill and Lisa and, and all of the others to get things started off. Well, you know, the last 17 years, um, I have been doing very large digital transformations um, for big multinational companies, ING, Philips, Barclays Bank. And um, going through that, I, I, I was a little unsatisfied with what we were doing. So we were spending a lot of money on multi-year projects. And when I reflected on it, I felt that a very large amount of that money had gone towards project management, essentially, right. from companies like Accenture and McKinsey and Bain, and um, and hadn't really resulted in a better experience for people. So I thought, you know, this is really what we need to focus on now, as we as we come through the service economy and we get into this experience economy that Joe Pine wrote about, uh, you know, twenty years ago. Um, we need to do things differently and we need to really understand what is it going to take to create a memorable experience for employees and for the business, uh, for the customers that matters to the business. And that's kind of how I got into it. And we've been learning ever since. Yeah, excellent. So today we wanted to get our viewers um, three parts to it, right? One is to focus on the experience essentials. What do you mean by the essence of experience in a, in a similar manner. And do you have a, an experience framework that people can think about how do we go about? Like, because it's like a maze. Everybody talks about experience in their own world uh, with all this customer satisfaction to net promoter scores, you name it. We have all seen a lot of metrics and measurement. So the question would be also to define a framework if it is there and then take us through the experience journey. And then we will have some time for Q&A. So broadly covering these three aspects, experience essentials, experience framework, and experience journey. And then we will obviously ask Q&A as people are listening to. We have had some pre-recorded questions from people in terms of what they wanted to ask, because. Uh, but we will also take some live questions as people are. So if people are attending this live, please post uh, questions on the live chat and we will pick it up from there. So over to you, Alan. Thank you, Suresh. So basically, the what you were saying is that these three things, the overview experience and how we get here and, and how we move forward with it. So let me just start with one slide on what is experience, because I think it's, a, it's actually, as you said, it's a complex world, but it's a simple idea. And that idea is that people will forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And so this is really the essence of experience, whether it's uh, brand experience, customer experience, employee experience, patient experience, that's really what it boils down to. And why does it matter? Well, because people actually make decisions and form their opinions based on their experience, not necessarily what was in the product manual, not necessarily what was in the service level agreement, but how did you make me feel at the end of this? The other thing is that we found experience is cumulative. So yes, one bad experience can really uh, turn you away from a, an employer or from a, from, a, from a business, but generally experience is cumulative over time. So if you, if you understand that and you measure that, it's okay when you make a mistake, as long as you recover from it, it, it will not necessarily be fatal. But I think a lot of the way we've looked at experience in the past has been transaction for transaction. Experience definitely has consequences because even when you provide people with rational data, 
if that doesn't if that doesn't jive with how they feel they will still go with how they feel irrespective of how logical and compelling the data is and the other thing is experience is about outcomes and and i think in the service world we've spent a lot of time looking at steps in a process and in fact, you know, service management in ITIL 4 is, is basically defined as a service value chain, which is, which is also steps in a process. And all around this, as I've sort of made very clear, perception is reality. So how people look at the situation, even if, if it's objectively wrong, subjectively, that is still going to determine the outcome for them. And of course, at the end of the day, we want to make people happy because we think happy employees are good for the bottom line. So experience is about how people feel about a product, a service, an interaction, or you, depending on your service. Okay. Now, what's changing? Um, as we get into the experience economy, organizations are really understanding it's very important to deliver a positive experience. The average Fortune 500 company is losing $1 billion a year on poor employee experience. And McKinsey says, you know, disengaged employees cost businesses 450 to 550 billion a year. Wow. So there's a lot in this, right? There's a lot in it. Now, that doesn't mean people are going to rush and going to go and say, oh, I need to do it now. But what you are seeing is a slow movement. You know, when I was uh, doing my executive stints, our primary measure was shareholder value. What are we doing for the shareholder? Now we are moving to customer experience and employee experience. A lot, a lot more executives are now being measured on that. And so the business needs more than people process technology. You know, that was the mantra that we came up with when we launched ITIL back in 1992. Right. But now you also need to have vision and you need to be able to enabling and executing and embracing experience if you're really going to make this work. I think experience matters more than ever because of four, four things that are really coming, bearing down on us one now. And, and I know a lot of our audience are going to be in Asia and in India. Um, multi-channel workforce sourcing has been driving the Indian and Asian economies for a long time. Right. The idea of having a workforce of internal, external partners and third-party resources uh, needs to work its way through the experiences that we design. So multi-channel workforce is now really important when we're putting together these new experiences. I think secondly is this multi-generational workforce. You know, I did a live event recently. It's good to be back to live events in person. Sure. And um, and I was I was I was talking about something out of 1997 because I'm an old man, and that seems to be reasonably close to me. And I asked people in the room, you know, how old were you in 1997? Half the people in the room hadn't been born in 1997. Right. So Gen Z are here, and certainly in India, where the average age is much lower than many many other countries. The multi-generational workforce is changing the way people look at their work, what they expect, right. Right. what they sign up for. And there's this competition for talent. You know, um, talent has more choices now. People aren't necessarily going into, uh, you know, into Tata or into Wipro to be there for life. You know, they're now looking at what can I get now? What experience can I create for myself? How can I move my resume forward? So there's a lot of competition out there. And the last one is the, the ways we, that we work together. There's a lot of ecosystems working together uh, in new ways. And I think there, coming out of the pandemic, there are three big things. First of all, there is the post-pandemic hybrid workplace design. What's it going to look like? And experience is obviously at the core of that, because why are we designing a new workplace? It's to improve the employee experience. That's the only reason we're doing it. The great resign of 2021, you know, last year, 4 million people resigned in the United States, 20% of the workforce in the UK anticipate that they will have a new employer before the end of the year. That's big, is big numbers, big impact. Right. And lastly, and I think people miss this a little bit, we've been moving for a while to service uh, as a service world, whether it's a subscription based world or software as a service. And what that also does is it creates at will relationships across your spectrum. So you can, you know, your customers can stop at any time almost. So if you're, if you're still working on a transaction instead of working on a relationship, right. you're going to have a real, real problem. 
absolutely and and this is also very important that you mentioned that um the relationshipism that we talk about is going to be the binding factor because i can still have a lousy service today but because i have known you for so many years i will bear with that lousy service for a minute because i know alan for a while so i would probably give you back the business and this has happened in many of the instances that we have worked so yeah. you're absolutely right well, I'm always surprised at how many people have major issues with their sourcing supplier and they still renew with them. Right. And so, and, and sometimes that's just being captured. You know, it's, it's a function of not having the budget to do a new uh, transition transformation. But sometimes it's because when they weigh it over, they say, you know what? Most things work well most of the time, whether we really want that upheaval. So experience matters. Now, if we look, because I know a lot of people in our world, in my world and in your world, Suresh, are coming to this from a service background, service right. management background. So I wanted to just go through what is what is the evolution. Now, after the Second World War, we were very firmly in a product economy. You know, it was mass consumables, cars, refrigerators, houses were being upgraded. And in that world, the center of the product economy was the utility and the warranty of the product. Okay. And so you would see that on the guarantees, the support, the break fix that you would get. In the 1980s and 90s, we started to move to the service economy big time. And in the service economy, you still had the product economy. It was still there because we were still had, you know, computers and we still had laptops and we still had those things. But now the focus was on the utility and the warranty of the service. And we had all of these illities, you know, like the availability, reliability, serviceability, scalability. And, and so the SLA, the service level agreement, was really about trying to explain the utility and the warranty of the service. And we see that, especially in ITIL version three, that had a big, a, a big uh, part of that was about utility and warranty. Right. Now we're in the experience economy. And what we see again is it doesn't replace it, but it absorbs it, it absorbs it. So we still need to understand products. We still need to understand services, but now we're looking at the utility and warranty of the experience. Are we delivering the experience that people need or want uh, in order to continue the long-term relationship? And we're gonna measure that through indicators of the experience. And we'll talk a little bit about XLAs, experience level agreements and XIs, experience indicators in a second. So really what I want people to understand is that this isn't we're swapping out one type for another, but it's an evolution and each economy basically absorbs the one before it. Sure. I get this question all the time. Are we getting rid of SLAs? And no, we're not because an XLA is an evolutionary approach. An XLA really never replaces an SLA. They're both required. You still need to manage service. It's just not going to be the thing that we focus on most. It is the thing that the supplier will still need to be good at. And if you're in-house, you need to be good at, but it's not going to be the thing that the business is going to be. So would that mean that SLA is going to be just a hygiene factor, but now not a wow factor anymore? That's what I, I think that's very well said. I think, I think hygiene factor, I don't think people, I, that doesn't make me feel good about it, but, but I think you're right. You know, and even now, you know, I was talking to, uh, to an Indian provider the other day and he was telling me, his customers are telling me, stop talking to me about SLAs. I don't care anymore about SLAs. Right. I okay. want you to tell me what is the experience you're going to give us. Sure. So I think it's, it's, it's getting traction. Now, what's the difference? So, you know, obviously the service level agreement belongs in the service level economy. And, and when we created SLA contracts over 30 years ago, it was to solve a very particular problem. You know, there was, a, there was the rise of outsourcing. And if you want to give something that you've built over 20 years to somebody else to run, you need to define that. So an SLA often tells you what is a supplier expected to do? What does good look like? How are they going to provide that service? What happens if they don't? What are the penalties? What are the consequences of that? And so that service level agreement made a lot of sense in the service economy. And it still is the fundamental building block for many of our business relationships. What the experience uh, level agreement does is it really focuses on a commitment to create a defined experience using experience indicators. 
So that's really what we are. So we're really focusing on experience that matters to the business. And because it matters to the business, it needs to concern itself with a business outcome. And usually that is about creating or preserving value. And it needs to focus on recording the sentiment regarding the experience, which we don't really do in service level. And then the last is we are looking for empirically gathered data. So we're not just looking at how do you feel, but how does that map back to what's really happening in terms of the operational data? Now that's a very important point on the sentiment that you mentioned, because um, it's a point in time that we track my response that came to the service desk and when it got resolved and over a point of time or the interactions over a period of time is never captured because that's not part of our scope within that putting the ticket yeah exactly right exactly right and we'll talk a little bit about that because i think today a lot of the questions that we ask uh we we call them customer satisfaction scores but they're not they really are workforce management scores about how long did somebody take to answer a phone how nice were they on the phone would you hire that person that's not about your experience that's about that's about workforce that you're putting in front of the employee and I'm not saying it's not important, but I think people confuse that a lot. So even if I say I would, I would, if I had to hire that person, I would, it doesn't mean I'm happy. Okay. Now, this is the way we would stack this. We call this the XLA stack. So, you know, we sit down uh, as a team and we decide what is the desired experience, whether that is for an employee, could be something like onboarding, or it could be a custom experience in, in a showroom, or it could be a patient experience in an emergency room. And then we decide how we're going to define that. And we, we create the XLAs, the experience level agreements behind that. And of course, we need to measure the, XL, uh, the experience levels. And those are questions and things that we're looking for that give us an indication about how well we're doing it. That whole top part of the stack, we call the X data stack. That's the sentiment level. It's nearly always, especially in information technology, but also in healthcare, it's built on an operational data stack of patient monitoring systems, of MRI systems, or, and they have SLAs, and they have KPIs around those. And so when we're looking for the XLAs, we choose those service level agreements that map to it. So for instance, there are, I think, 987 KPIs in service now. Of the 987 KPIs in service now, about 45 are around experience. So we're very interested in those 45 off, at, off the bat. That's the thing that we're interested in. And then how many, how many of the 45 uh, user experience part has been captured by providers in, in your experience? Very little. So, so on, on average, 2% of the KPIs that a provider is contracted to do have anything to do with experience. 98% of the KPIs have little or nothing to do with experience. And when I talk to providers about that, they don't, they don't know which 45 KPIs in service now are relevant. So that's why we have a lot of customers who are in the sourcing business who are really trying to get their own uh, mind around what is it that I need to be measuring myself. Sure. And this, this shows you kind of what the combination of XLAs and SLAs is needed. You know, so if you have green SLAs, but you have red sentiment, then you have this famous watermelon that Barclay Ray uh, invented, uh, I think, 10 years ago, that, you know, where you're green on the outside and deep red on the inside, and that's not a good position to be in, especially if you don't know about it. Right. And you're always surprised as a supplier. What we're looking to get is green on the outside, green on the inside, which is a kiwi or a lime or something like that. There's also such a thing as a reverse, a, a reversed watermelon, where we could have a green XLA and red SLAs. And that gets really interesting because that kind of disproves how important the SLA is. When you have a red SLA and you still have green sentiment, you've got the wrong SLA. Right. <laughs> so... The three challenges that an XLA has to solve are these. It's the first one is triangulation. Now, if you look at the way we measure service, service desk, for instance, it's usually a transaction. And we're not looking at this, we're not looking at triangulating that transaction 
on another on a, on another le level. So what we try to do is to say, okay, so how what is the technology component that plays a role in the sentiment? What is the business transaction that the employee is trying to do with that technology, and how do they feel about that? So the first thing an XLA has to do is that triangulation. The second thing it has to do, which also doesn't come out of customer sat, is so what, what now? So, okay, you've given me an MPS. You've given me a survey. So what? So what? And, and, and that's the question that we can't usually answer. Right. And if we can't answer the so what, then we don't know what the what now is. What are we going to do next? What action should we be taking? And then the last thing is we have to map to business economic value because we're only really interested in the, in the impact that the experience has on the business. So we're not as interested in things like psychological safety of teams, which is a very important subject, don't get me wrong. But what we're more interested in is, is patterns of experience that are leading to inefficiency or, or, or inhibiting commercial value or customer value. And so these uh, are the five uh, business economic values that we include in the uh, experience framework. Okay. So the XLA takes these things into account and we've got to be able to answer how do we, you know, how is the experience shaping people's opinions? What is the cumulative experience? Are we achieving the outcomes? What are the consequences? Why are people reacting the way they are? And are positive experiences making people happy? That's the world that we're in. Now, next part is the, the experience framework that you referred to. So we said, okay, we've got four phases in this. Experience is, is very volatile. Um, and you have to start off with envision. And it, so we have four pieces, envision, which is basically knowing where you are and where you want to go. Enable, where you actually do the work of designing and creating your XLAs. Execution, where you build your experience management capability and you put those XLAs into operation. And then embrace, because experience will change. You know, we know that service levels rarely change. In fact, we've seen service levels and KPIs survive multiple outsourcing contracts, but they're 15 years old, unchanged. Um, whereas that's not possible with experience because people are fickle, people are self-programming sensors, and they immediately adjust their opinions on every experience that they have. So you've got to keep in touch with that. So the, so the experience framework is guided by the experience advisory board. So these are all very, very smart people like yourself, Suresh, who, uh, who advise us from different perspectives, from a BRM perspective, or an OBM perspective, a CX perspective, training perspective. And what we have now done is we've taken this experience framework and it is now an APMG certified education program. Right. There are credentials attached to the experience framework. The envision phase is really navigating like you do with GPS. So right. when you turn on your GPS in a car, the first thing you get is a map of where you are, like you are here or in a mall, you are here. Right. And then the next thing it says, where do you want to go? And you say, well, I want to go to, if you're in a mall, you know, I want to go to Louis Vuitton. Yeah. Or if you're in a car, I want to go to grandma's. And then it will give you options. You know, do you want to take a toll road? Do you want the fastest route? Do you want the scenic route? You know, and, 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 and then, and so then you get a route. And at the end of it, you, you then do your excursion. And the map will follow you and tell you, be careful, there's a police patrol up ahead or there's a, there's a disused car on the side of the road or there's a tire. And it will, so that's really what the Envision's about. It's really figuring out where are we now? Where do we need to go? And how are we gonna get there? That's what we do in the envision phase. Sometimes people know already, this is what we have to solve. Sometimes you still got to talk to the employees or the consumers to find out what their needs and wants are. Then we create the XLAs, we define the target audience. And in this phase, the most important thing that we have to do, which is the technical part of it, is we have to enable the flow of data to the XLA. And that means that we have to design and implement experience indicators. And they can be 
operational. So they could come out of something like NextThink or SysTrack or one of the one E or some of those tools, or it could come out of you know cameras or it could come out of surveys. And we have to triangulate that. And we have something called an experience reference matrix that maps all of these things. We say, this is what the data means. That's what we do in this phase. Well, I think that's a very important phase because a lot of time we have a huge volume of data, but making sense of what it means, connecting all the dots and triangulation is, is kind of the key, isn't it? In terms of the proof is in the pudding of how do you derive meaningful, uh, actionable insights for people to take some actions. Absolutely. And that is a skill and we teach that skill. And, and sometimes we, we have to, you know, sometimes we teach people to fish. Sometimes we take them out on fishing trips. Sometimes sure. we have to fish for them, depending on their situation and urgency. And then we have the execution. And then we've got to organize ourselves to communicate, implement, and manage these XLAs. They are living organisms that need nurturing. And oftentimes, especially the larger customers, you are going to need to define and implement an experience management organization. So we've been working on that with very large companies, you know, like ABN AMRO and Rabobank and, and um, Unisys and companies like that. Sometimes smaller companies, it's really about getting the right people together. Right. Um, but that's how we do it. So, and so the framework explains all the things that you need to think about and how you can build those teams and what they need to be good at. And then you're never done. So the embracing phase, so most of these phases take 30 to 90 days, depending on the size and complexity. Embrace never ends because you are continually monitoring, communicating, calibrating, and expanding your horizon to other groups. You know, so you're going to be connecting to UX, you know, connecting to the DevOps teams, connecting to the CX teams, because they're all in islands on their own. Right. And, and that's my experience. You know, the CX people are all looking at social media and, and they're on their journeys. And they don't, they're not really connected to supply chains or anything like that. And then you've got the DX uh, uh, people out there as well. So there's the, and they've got the brand people. So there's a lot of opportunity here. The real thing I just want to mention is, is there is something called the gravity to average, which is a concept that was, uh, uh, was created by BCG. Basically what they see is if I give you the experience today and I give you the same experience tomorrow, you will experience that as less because you've already discounted it. So if you can think back to 2007 when you had your first iPhone, how amazing was that thing? That yeah, was, it was magic. a magic It was a, that was a magic thing. Yeah. But now we talk about iPhone 13 and it's, I don't know, it's just another thing. Yeah. It's just, it's, oh, it's, the cameras. It's BAU. It's a BAU. So no longer an excitement. It's just a, a, a table stick altogether. Right. So we've got to get good at understanding it, recognizing it, and then recreating it. Yeah. And I'm going to finish up now. So it's XLA season in 2021. And for the people who are like, XLA season, I didn't know it existed. Well, it starts on Watermelon Day, which is <laughs> August the 3rd, and it ends on Kiwi Day, which is December the 21st. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so those, that's the time that you have to get started. And in fact, if you start on August the 3rd, you can have implemented and be up and running by December 21st. Now we're almost halfway through, so you've got to, got to get, your, get your skates on. Um, and so, you know, in conclusion, I say, okay, you're in XLA season, so do something. You know, take a course, call Suresh, start a project, join XLA Cave, watch XLA TV, but do something now because we are in XLA season. It's time. Excellent. So a couple of questions that has come in, um, just give us a bit of background around the um, XLA TV and XLA cafe. What does it mean? And what is that benefit for people who are, who do not have much of idea about where to go about starting it? If they want to get inspired from other organizations getting implementing that, would that be a good forum for them to have a chat on that or to get an understanding? I think it is, Suresh. I think that, there are two different things, right? So XLA Cafe really is people coming together to talk about experience. And it's, it's just kicked off. It's, um, it's, 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 it's more of a community. 
basically, because what we do believe is experience management is a movement. And I know more about it than a lot of people, but I, I am still learning and I'm, you know, I'm learning from everybody that I, I talk to. And I think that's, that's kind of the nature of the experience journey. It's a movement, so you need to have a community. XLA TV is a little bit different. What we have found out over the past two years is that you have people that need to be convinced. And they need to say, well, why should I do this? I'm already doing that. Or, and, but you also have people that need to be reinforced. Like, I know I need to do it. I just don't know what's next and where do I start? And those questions that you just asked. That's where XLA TV comes in. So XLA TV basically has two programs. One is called The Climb. And The Climb is where we listen to the smart people, the philosophers, uh, the, the executives, you know, the, the people that are driving the programs in the large companies and what their vision is of where it's going. And then we have another stream, which are the new alchemists. They're the people that are taking the lead of, of technology and turning it into the gold of experience. And they're the practitioners. They're the people who are saying, you know, they're the people, at, you know, at Philips and AB and AMRO and Sabre and Pega. And these are the people who say, this is how we're doing it. This is how we started. This is what we've learned from this. And I think those are great places to go to get a sense of what other people are doing. Yeah. And we're building that out. You know, I know, Suresh, you, you, you're on the... Uh, you're one of the hosts of XLA TV, so you know, and you're always actively looking for people um, who are going to come forward and share their story. I think you did one for Wreck It recently and one for right. Genesis. Yeah. So these are people that share their story, and I think that's great for people trying to get into this. And in terms of adoption, um, Alan, because you you talk with a lot of clients across, what is the level of adoption, particularly in the Asia Pacific region? Because that's a region that we have been kind of thinking about. Is it Again, there are two set of people, right? One is the, the outsourcing world of where we see managed services kind of contracts. And so India is a, is a kind of a big player around that space, right? Yeah. So is that going to be more relevant for uh, product-based companies or very specific towards uh, managed service providers? Where do you think? I mean, this is always a question being asked in the forums. Who does it best fit when it comes to XLA? So what is your thought on that? Well, I, I think that if I look at some of the Indian suppliers, if I look at Cognizant and Tech Mahindra and, and TCS, they are engaging, they're, they're, they're working on it, they have good programs. Um, there, there's a team at Tech Mahindra, it's a small team, but it's a very, very smart team. But they've got a lot of work to do because you know, think of the scale, think about changing this industry because it affects contracts and it affects, it affects a lot of people and how they work. Right. You know, I, I recently had a, a conversation with TCS about they, they did one of their first XLA based uh, contracts. And what did it mean? Because, you know, we all know how or many people on the call will know how it works in India and how you have these dedicated teams working remotely who do their best to understand the customer that they're serving. And they almost become like groupies for the customer that they serve. And we talked to TCS about, well, how does this change? How do their incentives change? How do they connect? And it's big. It's a big deal. But I think every major outsourcer realizes that the race to the bottom, labor arbitrage, cost per seat, that's a losing game. You know, you've got to find a way to get to value. I think the Indian players understand that. I would even count Accenture as an Indian player. That may be more controversial. I know they're not headquartered in India, but I think that's by far their biggest uh, biggest presence. But then you also have people in Asia Pacific and, and certainly in Southeast Asia, I think there is a big push for better employee experience. It's a competitive market. I see movements in places like Singapore uh, where people are thinking, HR people are looking to form new relationships with the tech people. I see that in financial services, but I wouldn't, I mean, I'm, this is still a very emerging market. It's a growing market. I do believe the market is going to be substantially bigger than for instance, the ITSM market was simply because it, 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 it reaches, it reaches much beyond tech. It reaches into healthcare and education right. and other areas, and it reaches into CX and, and DX and VX. 
So, you know, if you look at it in those terms, or we, you know, we're just starting out. Yeah. So in terms of, I think one of the key things is also about the enablement part. The enablement part that we are talking about is to educate those players in the market or even people who are service management professionals to understand a little bit more about the essence of experience, understanding about XLAs, looking at XI, looking at an experience management office. Um, so how critical would you be um, validating from uh, the course perspective that we have from an XLA collab that will be useful for aspirants to get better equipped before they can actually navigate through this maze? Well, I think when we look at the course structure, you know, the first two courses, which is the essence of experience and the foundation certificate, are really to, in the same way we did in the ITSM world and in the BRM world, it's just to get people to understand the core concepts and what's different. Because if you're a professional today, whether you're in business relationship or you're in IT service management, you know, you know about technology, you know how important technology is. So this is really about just giving you a different view right. of what you know well. When you get to the mastering classes about mastering uh, XLAs and mastering XMOs, it is, it is more challenging because the way that we have built this in the framework is we do have a lot of technical base input to the XLAs. So people who have grown up in service management, who are familiar with the data flows, are familiar with service now, maybe they've looked at Happy Signals, maybe they've looked at NextThink or SysTrack or, or something like that. They are very suited to it, but it is, it is a, a, I say the mastering courses are not easy. Right. They're not simple. And, and so you do, yeah, you, you need to bring your thinking hat and you need to apply to get those. Well, to be honest, and when we had the sessions with Bill and hold the mastering classes, you know, I was blown away by the level of depth that you can go to meet that triangulation, you know, even if that is a spreadsheet to augment all the data of the X data, the O data, which is the sentiment data and the objective data. How do you bring this all together? So uh, is that a push by, there's two aspects towards this um, XLA. One is the employee experience, as you rightly mentioned, with the pandemic. A lot of people, if you remember, in India, we are in an all high attrition rate of 30%. Uh, people are leaving the organization. So is it uh, attribute to the lack of engagement which is prompting people to leave uh, more? Are there more opportunities people are going into cloud and DevOps and other green pastures? Because it's, it's, it's skyrocketing in terms of the opportunities today in India. Well, I, I, I do think it's different because uh, now again, I, I would not presume to tell you about the Indian market, but what I do, what I see personally is that when we were in, when, when the Indian market was about labor arbitrage, I do think that people realized that they were literally an asset and they, and they, they started to think of themselves as an asset. Right. And so they started to say, well, if I'm just an asset and I can get, you know, a few rupees more over here, why wouldn't I go over there? And especially when all of these companies kind of look the same, they all had the big call centers, they all had these big, big, you know, centers, everyone had air conditioning. So it didn't really matter where you were. And I, so I think there was a phase in the early growth of the Indian market that people also saw themselves as fungible assets that could move around. I think that's changed because, you know, you've seen a huge professionalization in India. You know, I remember having conversations when I was working for TCS when employees said, yeah, well, you know, we're going to keep the smart work uh, in the United States and we're going to do the menial work. We're going to farm out to India. And I would always say you, the problem is you didn't tell the Indians about that because the Indians have no intention of staying in. And if you see now the, the high end work that Tata does for Ferrari or, or, you know, and that's all changed. And I think with that, the Indian professional, especially the Gen Z professional, 
is looking for something different. They're not, they're not just looking for a few more rupees. They are looking for something that's meaningful, that they are progressing as professionals, that they're getting new opportunities. So I would, I, I'm cautious, but I think the Indian market uh, and the people coming into the Indian market have different expectations than they had even 10 years ago. Excellent. So last question is, given a choice, what do you think would be to predict the future in the next two years to three years? Where do you think this XLA is going to take there? And what does it take for practitioners like us to work towards the goal? Because there's a lack of awareness, in my opinion. There's not a lot of people understanding how do you go through that. So how do you think that top solutions and and as, as a consulting partner of XLA Collab can make a difference and make an impact, uh, not only Asia Pacific, but globally uh, with our broader range of experience around service management, DevOps, business relationship management, connecting the entire ecosystem, right? From the sea level to, to the grassroots. Um, where do you think that we as top solutions can play a role? Well, I, I think you, you sort of hit it on the net. What, what... What's different about this world that we're now in is exactly what you just said. It's about connecting the dots. So we're going to need professionals who understand service, understand all the complexities of service, are, are comfortable with the data and technology streams around service, but also understand how to connect to business value, or also comfortable with the ideas of productivity or commercial value. And so you're, you're looking for people that are, are going to grow and are able to grow. And I think where we are right now is we've got to get more, very, very many more people with the fundamentals. Because of what's also happening on the other side is the tooling side. The tooling side is going very, very quickly. And I believe over time that we, you know, if we think back to the, one of the first slides about this multi-generational workforce and its expectations, we're going to get to a point, not tomorrow, but within a few years that we're talking about crafting micro experiences. Right. Um, uh, and also bringing the, those employees that are really on stage in front of a customer, of empowering those in new ways. And we're going to need to understand how the technology actually works right. and what part of the technology is actually relevant. So I think the, 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 the people that are going to be good at this are going to be those inquisitive, hybrid, high energy people, because this is going to be a massive learning exercise for all of us. Right. So I think I'm thrilled, uh, Alan, we were able to get you today to share a few perspectives around it. And it's a, it's a journey, as you rightly said, but we are upbeat about it. And um, having been part of the Alchemist, uh, sessions, the XLA TV, what I found was that there is some fascinating work being done across different parts of the globe that we need to socialize a lot more things. So I, I think the opportunities for us are huge, comparing to starting with enablement, um, making people understand how to fish or how to make them fish, and then also bringing them into a state of maturity that they can be self-sustainable. So, so that's the whole pioneering movement that uh, can, can, can change the whole dimension. And I hope that as we start to continue these conversations, we will bring in more people as part of the bandwagon because that's what we need, right? We need more practitioners to be vocal about how experience can be measured. It's just not about digital experience. It's not about employee experience. It's also about um, a client experience. And only when everybody in the value chain start resonating with that um, aspect will you even make a difference so there is a fundamental some kind of a lift um, facelift that we need to do do some groundwork before we kind of do that so I hope we will take that into stride but uh, really happy to have you today and share your perspectives and I hope uh, we'll get more inspired more to get more people joining around yeah I, I, I couldn't agree more I, I think that Looking at things differently. I mean, I'll just finish with one example. Sure. One example, and then I will, I will shut up. <laughs> if you go to uh, Disney or Universal World and you spend 30 minutes in a queue 
to go on a ride. At the end of that, you are going to weigh up. Was this, was this a good use of my time? Right. Was the 30 minute wait and the response of my children usually, was it worth it? What different is that to I am the 10th caller waiting for 25 minutes on a call before I get an answer? How different is that when I say, was this worth my time? Was this a good use of my time? And when we then see that 51% of incidents are never recorded at a service desk, maybe we have the answer. Correct. Absolutely. That's a spot on question to trigger for the rest of the week because we are on a holiday for Ganesh Chaturthi coming on to 10th. It's one of the festivals we, we really oh, like about it. Love so we say Ganapati Bappa Moria. And, and, and I hope that uh, it's a very good food for thought. And uh, thanks, Alan. And keep inspiring thanks us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for this uh, being a part of the live event. If you have any further questions, put your comments and we will reach out to you further, right? Until then, for the next live event, stay safe and um, keep thinking about Kiwis because it's uh, XLA season as what Alan Nance wraps it up. Thank you so much.